Yes, sir, Dr. Sachin. Uh, after reading 5.5, Yale School of Deconstruction, uh, it seems to me that 1970s, during 1970s, Yale School has been the hub of the practitioners of deconstruction in the literary theories. Uh, in the light of this, would you like to throw uh, some more light on the characteristics of Yale School of Deconstruction? Yeah. Thank you, Dede. Uh, yes, Yale School is uh, very, or Yale University, Department of English, Univers Yale University, has played a very important role in propagation of Derrida's ideas in America and consequently into the whole world. Earlier, uh, post-structuralism or Derrida were confined to continental traditions of European philosophy. With deconstruction going into Yale, it became a kind of uh, a uh, real new thing breaking on the scene after new criticism. This was something which was more new than new criticism. So it became very fashionable and the people associated with this department, the four names, uh, Paul Deman, J. Hillis Miller, uh, uh, Harold Bloom and Jeffrey Hartman. These four people actually made deconstruction very popular or unpopular you can say in America. In fact, it became notorious so as the people also titled them as Yale Hermeneutic Mafia of four people. Mm -hmm. But if you look at all these four people, then all of them are very different in their occupations, mm -hmm. in their preoccupations with literary criticism. But for the first time, deconstruction became a school of literary criticism mm -hmm. because of Yale. Uh, earlier, it was largely in the domain of philosophy. So Yale School is responsible for bringing deconstruction into literary criticism in a big way. Okay. Uh, some of the most important characteristics as you have are, one is uh, looking at literature as primarily a rhetorical or figurative construct. Okay. And, uh, and they argue that language being uh, full of figurative component, what happens is that language is a very unreliable tool for communication of meaning. So when I say somebody is an ass, mm -hmm. right? We, I'm using a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But what happens that it? Uh, I'm then uh, ask myself whether I have to take it literally. Yeah. Does he have ears and four legs, yeah. or he actually has characteristics of an ass, yes. right? So it creates a kind of uh, ambivalence. Mm -hmm. So what uh, figurative language does is that it uh, puts language as a very problematic entity. Okay. So all these four critics were focused on this figurative component of literature and they showed that literature is, uh, can create multiplicity of meanings mm -hmm. by focusing on various uh, figures of speech. Mm -hmm. A simple example can be when I say my love is like a red red rose that's newly sprung in June then it really makes no logical or rational sense mm -hmm. if you want to analyze this in a logical way. Mm -hmm. But it makes some sense at figurative level, that is some metaphor. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, figurative aspect is what, what actually undoes one interpretation and produces multiplicity of interpretations. Mm -hmm. So that is one very prominent aspect of Yale school. The second is they question both the aesthetic approach to literature or formalist approach on one hand. On the other hand, they also question the historicist mm -hmm. or sociologist approach to literature by saying that language does not take you directly to society mm -hmm. or outside of language. So uh, language is not a transparent medium of communication. Yeah. So, and what makes it opaque? or non-transparent is the figurative component. So that's what they argue. Secondly, what we understand to be aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, pleasure that we derive from literature is when we mistake, mm -hmm. in uh, Paul Deman's word, materiality of signifier or the materiality of signified. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say red, red rose, then the image of red rose comes in our mind. So we feel that the word red rose the materiality of it is similar to the materiality of actual red rose that we see in garden or in a shop. So this mistaking mm -hmm. of signifier for signified is what creates aesthetic illusion. So Paul Deman argues that aesthetics is a very illusionary effect 
of language and so is social and historical one so both uh, people who study literature from sociological angle mm -hmm. as well as people who are interested in literature for aesthetic aspect both find deconstruction as a very challenging and very troublesome kind of uh, critical approach mm -hmm. so that's the second very important characteristics and the third important characteristics of uh, Yale school is their preoccupation with romanticism mm. and they often uh, read the important romantic texts as uh, creating a different kind of meaning than we are taught to read into it okay. for example romanticism is characterized by metaphors and symbols mm -hmm. but uh, Paul Demand demonstrates that it's the allegory and metonymy which is the most important literary device in the romantic poetry mm -hmm. and thus he wants to show that whole romantic desire to transcend mm -hmm. the difference between subject and object as in words where the subject is the poet the speaker and the object is nature mm -hmm. so this desire for uh, transcending this binary mm -hmm. is achieved through use of metaphors mm -hmm. so metaphor being more organic in romanticism but Paul Demand shows that it's not metaphor but allegory okay. that is very important in romanticism so uh, his reading of romanticism is very uh, counter conventional and he actually manages to argue and show that there can be two interpretations of a text mm -hmm. and we are left with undecidability to which interpretation is right so these are some of very important characteristics mm -hmm. of uh, Yale school of criticism. It is from this perhaps the idea of free play of meaning emerges. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.